Burns, pop star and one of the most entertaining. My coast is in police custody. Outrageous. Come and have a look at my vagina. And outspoken. I wouldn't piss on her if she burst into flames. Reality stars we've ever seen. He was good at being bad. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a fuck. Only the good die young. I ain't dying anytime soon. Singer Pete Burns, uh, who's died at the age of 57. Burns died, according to his manager, of a massive cardiac arrest. As surprised transatlantic news studios reported his unexpected death, social media exploded and tributes poured in. But you know, I loved him as a kind of fellow weirdo. You know, he's someone that I kind of had a lot of admiration for. And I thought he was absolutely stunning. He's a real gentleman, and I don't use that word lightly. He really was, he was so sweet. The only word I can use is mesmeric. Tonight, in never-before-seen footage from his final interview, shot just months before his passing, Pete talks openly and with painful honesty about his fame. I didn't think it would be such an invasive thing. His ever-changing face. From a child, I knew I didn't have the face I was meant to have. And his death. I hope when I'm 80 that I get to heaven and God doesn't recognise me. This is Pete Burns, the last interview. Thank you for attending my little show. For the 21st century generation, Pete Burns was an outrageous reality TV star. She's really getting right up the crack of my ass. You're insincere to the point of nausea. But for anyone growing up in the 80s, Pete Burns was responsible for one of the greatest pop songs of the decade. He was a true pop icon. He loved life, he loved music, he was passionate about everything he did. He was everything I wanted him to be and more. Burns' story, from his first hit to final public appearance, is a cautionary tale of celebrity, one where the fairy tale can quickly become a nightmare. But it began in the 1960s with a very unconventional mother. My mother was a baroness and um, she was from Berlin. She was a silent movie actress and friends with Marlene Dietrich and stuff like that. So she knew all about film, makeup and prosthetics and stuff like that and what they used to do in those days. And she taught me all that as a child. His childhood um, was very uh, colourful and his mother was certainly very encouraging of Pete's flamboyance, you know, of individuality just to think freely, to be free and to do, to be boundaryless. Pete's unorthodox childhood saw him become a teenage rebel without even realising it, and before he was even a teenager. Talking about conformity, once many years ago, I can remember it from my 12th birthday, which is longer ago than I care to remember, I got my nose pierced at an Indian jeweller's, and the fuss and furore that it caused having a jewel in my nose. There was queues around the hairdressing salon I worked in to have a look at the boy with the pierced nose. It was like a really big deal. Now you go in Sainsbury's and they've got piercing in the lips, piercing here, piercing there, piercing everywhere. 15-year-old Pete met the love of his life, Lynn Corlett, while working in a hairdresser's. And even though he married again, they remained friends for life. I mean, Pete's relationship with Lynn, I think, is probably the most important relationship of both of their lives. You know, it was like a, a, a destiny moment. People, sometimes people are destined to meet. They were married for 25 years and said they were soulmates. By the mid-70s, Burns had landed himself a job at the legendary Probe Records in Liverpool and had become a local celebrity, not just for his unique image, but also as the most terrifying shop assistant on Merseyside. Well, Liverpool's always been an influential place and, it, you know, uh, Probe Records, where Pete was in those days, I mean, we were all aware of it. Probe Records was a fantastic place because you never knew what was going to go down at any minute of the day. 
When you walked into the shop, you were confronted by a six foot pirate or a six foot red Indian chief. There are so many stories of people going in there and being terrified of him because he would judge you on your choice. If you went in there and asked for a secret affair record, he'd throw it at you and say, no, that shit, you can't have it. Even the coolest of the local musicians who go on to have huge success themselves were wary of him at the time. They used to have these black contact lenses that actually covered the whites of his eyes. So we used to wear these in probes sometimes and they were terrifying. I was always pray that it wouldn't be Pete that served me because he was quite an intimidating looking character. He walked up to me in the 70s and said, you've copied my look. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the local style icon was soon fronting a string of bands and playing underground gigs at the likes of the legendary Liverpool club Eric's. In the 70s, I really wanted to go to Liverpool because I heard this Club Eric's was like the place to be. Mm -hmm. And we were terrified to go because we were told if we went to Liverpool, we'd get beat up. All right. Okay. <laughs> By 1980, he was in a band and was attracting record company interest. All they needed now was a name. The manager of the record label that Pete was involved with said, you better come up with a name because... I'm going to book you for a recording session. So I said, why didn't you call the band Wanted, Dead or Alive? And everyone went, oh, God, that's great, that, you know. He said, that's too long. And I said, well, what about Dead or Alive then? And he just looked at me and said, that is amazing. The name stuck and things started to take off. And in about 1983, I got a major record deal, which was a really big 10-album record deal. Dead or Alive's debut album came out in May 1984 and featured their first Top 40 hit, a 70s classic given a Pete Burns makeover and a sound straight out of the 80s gay club scene. But it was a new arrangement of an original Dead or Alive song from a little-known production trio called Stock Aitken and Waterman that plugged into the underground high NRG club sound of the mid-80s and took things to a new level. Pete will always be remembered for you spin me round. It, it was Stock Aitken Waterman's first hit. I mean, he made the future of that style of music happen. Thanks to Pete's mega hit, its producers would survive and go on to become the most successful in the business. Without spin me round, there would have been nothing. We were, we were literally down to half a point each. More than anything else, it was a record that took high energy overground and kind of defined what pop music became. You can have it records, but they don't do what Spin Me Round does. And that's not just because of Stock Aitken Waterman, because of the band or because of the song. It's because of Pete Burns. He, he could not never have known that that was going to go and create the sound of a generation. It is such a wonderful song. Once you've heard it, you never forget it, you know. Spin Me Round was going up the charts. It looked like it was going to go down the charts because this is the longest ever record to reach number one. You Spin Me Round took over four months to reach number one, spent 48 weeks in the charts and was a hit in another 15 countries worldwide. It was one of the defining records of the decade. But looking back in a typically forthright chat show appearance, Pete came to realise that the hit that changed his life could, and perhaps should, have never happened. So I don't quite understand why the radios aren't playing it. The first time around when I initially made that record, which was, it was actually 1984 that record was, was, was made and it got no response from radio and then in 1985 when it was actually number one it was not really supported by radio in a heavy way. I just think that I freak people out a little bit and they don't want to expose the nation's youth to people like me because they think I'm going to be really, really strange and unusual. And... But it was that very difference that made Pete's early TV appearances unmissable, as in this outrageous, supremely confident 1984 performance. The music industry may have been cold to begin with, but as far as music show viewers were concerned, as seen here, Pete was a hot property. 
You Spin Me Round sold 500,000 copies in the UK alone, and Pete's fame went stratospheric. But from the start, he had an uneasy relationship with it. Well, let's say, at first of all, it was notoriety, and then it quickly spread to fame. And um, there's no university or college you go to to learn to deal with fame. I wish he had a switch that he could have flicked it on and off to be seen and unseen in public. You don't all, just because someone's bought your records doesn't mean you're always going to be switched on to being thankful. He didn't really want the fame of You Spin Me Around and he's, he's, he, he often said he wasn't ready for it. He didn't expect it. He just wanted to make a song so that he could go and make another song. In early interviews, it was becoming obvious Pete was a reluctant star. I take pop music quite seriously. All, all that we've ever wanted to do was make good pop records. So the fact that you get asked to do certain things in order to promote your pop record... I they talk to me? No, not talk to you, like maybe get on an exercise bicycle or do things like that. Right. That's the side of it that I can't do because it just doesn't really gel with my personality. I really admire people that can do things like that. And because of my outward appearance, everyone expects me to be a particular flamboyant person and it's really a contradiction in terms. Right? Yeah. Pete was all about the pop, but not 24-7. Sometimes everyone wants a day off from it, don't they? They want to run around and just be um, a bit cooky and not be noticed and not have other people bother them. Next, the surgery that nearly killed him. I remember they got the priest in to do the last rites as well. And it's like, what's that old creep doing? He's going to fiddle with me. An unwelcome dose of reality. And I hope Brilliant. you fucking win. I hope you fucking win and you have that cross to bear. And the real cost of fame. What can I do about it? What do they want me to do? Look like Donatella and wear chocolate over my face? Burns, 80s pop icon and outrageous reality TV star, died suddenly in October this year. Just months before his death, he filmed a series of interviews in which he talked about his struggles with fame. First of all, it was notoriety and then it quickly spread to fame. And um, there's no university or college you go to to learn to deal with fame. He didn't really want the fame of You Spin Me Around, and he's, he's, he, he often said he wasn't ready for it. He didn't expect it. He just wanted to make a song so that he could go and make another song. The worldwide success of You Spin Me propelled Pete to superstar status, and in this reflective but typically frank interview decades later, confesses some ill-conceived choices. You got a good paycheck, your first paycheck. Can, mm. can you recall what you spent it on? My nose. <laughs> um, I, I'd always said I wanted to change my nose, and uh, that's the first thing I did, and it went horribly wrong. Pete wanted to get his nose fixed after it was broken in a fight in Liverpool, but his first trip to the surgeon was a disaster. I woke up covered in, in blood. It was so much blood, it was unbelievable, with, ch with tubes on my nose. The lovely sister came in and I said, I'm in pain because it was very painful. She said, you suck it in, you blow it out. I thought, oh, how kind, sister motherfucker. I went to the mirror and I nearly fainted. He'd removed most of my nose. It made Latoya Jackson's look like Barbara Streisand's nose. And I said, I've just hit number one in the charts, same day, number one in the charts. Pete was booked onto this performance with half his nose missing and had to improvise. The botch gave birth to what would become his signature look. So I made an eye patch, and the eye patch where it sat hid the side of the nose that was bad. Despite the botch surgery, Pete somehow managed to look on the bright side. My first experience of surgery, it wasn't a nightmare, it was just a mishap. It's like the equivalent of going to a beautician and getting badly waxed eyebrows. Um, it didn't strike me as a disaster because I got the eye patch out of it and I got the success and the image and everything. So it wasn't a disaster, I just wanted to correct it. But his unmistakable look made it almost impossible for Pete to have any privacy. The cost of fame was becoming too much to bear. When you're getting followed around the supermarket buying lean cuisines and someone puts in the sun, you're on a crash diet because you're too fat and stuff like that. It's like, oh my God, I can't do anything. 
I didn't enjoy a thing about my career. I didn't think it would be such an invasive thing. As the media frenzy escalated, things hit a new low. And there was one point where my mother was dying of lung cancer and a journalist dressed up as a nurse and got into the house to get a picture of her dying of lung cancer and stuff like that. So then you realise the fame's not all as cracked up to me. And it wasn't just the press causing peak problems. His growing fame attracted obsessive fans with increasingly strange demands. People related to you on a different level as though you could cure the children of terminal diseases and stuff like that. But I got letters saying, can you please come and talk to my son who's been in a coma for four months and if you can't make it, can you get Agni the false cog? You know, things like that. And you get people turning up at your door, poking at the letter box. With unwanted attention and Pete refusing to play ball with the UK press, the outspoken singer decided to take drastic action and step out of the limelight. In about 1992, I just made a conscious decision I was going to buy a house, settle down and just not have the fame game anymore, but it's easier said than done. I concentrated on working in Japan and America and didn't work on my own doorstep. I say, don't shit where you eat. So I didn't concentrate on my own uh, on England. I didn't release anything in England for many, many years. Although Pete took a back seat from music in the UK, a rare appearance on a 1994 TV pop quiz revealed a startling new look for the 80s superstar. It's Louis Louis. <laughs> Or Lulu. Lulu, <laughs> Lulu. 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 I, don't, I don't know who it's by. When everybody was reading The Enemy in the studio, Pete was reading Surgical Weekly. You know, Pete had the best diary for plastic surgeons I've ever seen in my life. By 2002, those surgical changes had become ever more obvious, as on this pop quiz panel show. And this TV appearance revealed that, shockingly, Pete now struggled to even drink from a glass. I know it's not usual, but, excuse me, I need, I, I need a straw for that, for obvious reasons. <laughs> for obvious reasons, I drool. I never saw Pete as a plastic surgery freak. I saw someone who was a pioneer. As a 1980s celebrity, Pete became one of the first to continually reinvent himself with the help of cosmetic procedures. The best thing you can do as a form of art is recreate yourself, you know, and I did recreate myself. I think people have a right to change their body if they don't feel right in it, and that's what Pete did, and I always thought he was phenomenally beautiful. But when he put his trust and face in several surgeons' hands, the risks of complications became much greater, as Pete discovered. Piss on his grave in a red dress. Um, but I walked into his office and he went, stop right there. It was like Sunset Boulevard. And I went, what? He went, put your head back. And I went, and he went, you need cheekbone implants. And he did this operation that was so archaic and primitive where he put cheap bone implants in, but they were here. And they jutted out like this. And I looked like I was dying of HIV. They were the worst thing ever. They would completely deform my face and pull my eyes down like this. Despite that awful early experience, Pete's surgical experimentation continued. Although in the end, things didn't get better. They got worse. This is really the first time that I've... I've um, commented on any of it or spoken about it in a rational manner. Just turned into the nightmare of my life. Had the lip injections been fine, I'd have long stopped. But the lip injections weren't fine, and they were done by the Lip King of London. And he's using this solution in penises and breasts and cheeks and brow bones and stuff like that. And one day he said, I've run out of evolution. It was called evolution, the solution. He said, I've run out, but I've got something similar. I've got something similar, <laughs> you know. And he said, it's completely safe and he injected it and then things started to go wrong. <laughs> and I did a gig with the Scissor Sisters and while I was singing, I could feel a very, very, there's no way to describe it, to say a burning sensation, an internal burning sensation in my lower lip. As soon as he'd come off stage, it was just like a kind of weird, like a little boil. Um, and he was just like, oh, that's really sore. So I phoned my surgeon and he said, 
come in and he held me down on the operating table and he got two syringes and punched them in. At least a pint and a half of yellow steaming fluid was vomited out of the lip. It literally didn't stop. And that was kind of the beginning of the whole trek down, you know, lip hell. And if I so much as touched my face, there would be an audible hissing. It would go, and out onto the mirror would vomit this yellow fluid, but it would go like five, six feet. It would just go, and it formed all around my mouth, all around my jaw, in the corners of my eye, on my nose, everywhere, little holes, like, like someone had um, put drill holes in, and it would just discharge down my face. So severe was the injection damage, Pete was told that his lips may have to be amputated. Thankfully, he was introduced to reconstructive surgeon Giovanni Ferrando, who wanted to avoid amputation. He was the first doctor that physically handled it. He said, I can do this. He had a big, big problem in the lips, uh, with uh, speaking and eating. On the brink of losing his lips and with a long surgical road ahead, Pete made a decision to leave England and move to Genoa in Italy with his partner and be closer to the surgeon, who'd also become his friend. Initially, we went for three months and it just ended up being nearly two years. Pipes, tubes, things going wrong, you know. He had hundreds of operations, hundreds. His life was, was in danger uh, minimum two, three times. The surgeries took their toll, both physically and mentally, but the couple persisted with treatment to save Pete's lips. It was very painful for the both of us because I didn't like to see him suffering. A lot of times he was quite um, dismissive. How I felt about it was clinically depressed. I got by with the help of a lady called Marina, who's Giovanni's friend, and my husband, and um, the help of a Louis Vuitton face mask so I could go out. Um, I'm tough, I got through it, you know. Uh, I just got through it without resorting to Valium and things like that or alcohol. I just got through it. I, every day every day I would think, OK, today's nearly over. I'm one step closer tomorrow. But it was baby steps, you know? It was baby steps. After nearly two brutal years of ongoing surgery and thousands of pounds later, Pete's lips were finally healed. In 2006, he was finally able to return home to London for good with his new love, Michael. His lips were fixed, but having spent his life savings on his face, Pete was on the brink of bankruptcy. In desperate need of money, he returned to our TV screens. Next, Big Brother's Biggest Bitch. You're insincere to the point of nausea. Pete Rock's reality TV. When anyone mentions Big Brother to me, they say, oh yeah, the Pete Burns year. It, that was like his year. But his fame comes at a price. I didn't understand it was going to cause such an invasion on my private life. Just months before the sudden death of 80s pop icon Pete Burns, a film crew captured what would be his last ever TV interview. Previously unseen footage reveals the reality of modern day celebrity. From his music career, to his surgical nightmares, to becoming a TV legend. In 2006, Pete was about to enter the celebrity Big Brother house. He'd racked up huge surgery bills and needed the cash. Why did no, you I'm do it? Why did you Because I go needed into the money. The Is that the, the money. only reason? But totally the only reason. I needed the money. To... Despite shying away from the cameras for over a decade, it was a decision that swept Pete back into the mainstream and made him part of reality royalty. When Pete got out that car, everyone just went completely mad for Pete. For many, it was the first they had seen of Pete. Hi, I'm Pete Burns. While for others, it was a reintroduction, although the extreme new look came as a shock. Pete Burns kind of came onto my radar in a big way when he appeared on Celebrity Big Brother. I sort of knew the name. I definitely had seen the music video for Spin Me Right Round, but he looked so different than he did in the music video when we saw him appear on the show. His look had clearly, you know, evolved. 
uh, in that uh, period. You see this guy who's like flamboyant and, and androgynous, but also is like much more of like, he, he could like, he could kick your head in. <laughs> I get to know your name. A man who dresses like a woman, but has no intention of becoming a woman. I think of myself totally as a man. I ain't no fairy. Pete was an instant hit. His super sharp personality and relationships in the house gripped the nation. What do you think of the house itself, Pete? It's vile. It looks like a bad LSD-induced trip to Ikea. Even when he was cruel, he was almost always right and was merely seeing what uh, other people might be thinking. Well, she's a lovely, lovely woman. I adore her, but I just told her to fuck off. I think he was a bit of a bully at times. But I'm allowed to say that, you know, he's probably up there going, oh, Michael trying to be kind. I like animals, but I like me better. Are you really, I've got to ask the question, are you really as nasty as Eleanor? Well, you see, the thing is that I've not seen the show and I'm yeah. not sorry for a damn thing that I said. And with the cameras rolling 24-7, the public got to see behind the mask. Right. You've got a bigger makeup collection than us two put together. He would wake up at four in the morning, like half three, and fully start, you know, doing his makeup and getting himself ready. And I don't even know when he slept, because he was the last one to sleep and the, and the first one up. It always smelled amazing. You quickly forget there are cameras when you're in the Big Brother house. What you saw on Celebrity Big Brother house was the real Pete Burns. But as Pete revealed in his last interview, being a reality TV star in the noughties was different from fame in the 80s. The great thing is about TV, and I haven't become a TV celebrity, I'm in people's living rooms and they see me, so they're used to me, so I can go down the street in any condition that I want and people won't think I need sectioning. Um, so the public are very friendly and full of love and warmth and stuff. It's different when you, it was different in the 80s when you were a pop star, because pop stars are kind of like up there. The public became hooked on the controversial and often hilarious entertainment provided by Pete in the 2006 Celebrity Big Brother house. I am my fair coat. There was an awful lot of controversy about his alleged gorilla coat. Gorilla? Fuck off. Which he wore with much aplomb, this big fur monstrosity, and announced it was from gorillas, who of course are an endangered species. Wearing a gorilla coat is definitely illegal. My boyfriend bought it for me. He told me it was gorilla. I know it's real. This created a huge storm outside, and in fact, the police came and arrested the coat. My coat is in police custody. But it was all just a laugh. He was a complete and utter wind-up merchant because I remember when I watched that, I, I was certain that that was a gorilla skin. Like, he had us all convinced. You just couldn't write it. You know, Pete Burns, in Celebrity Big Brother, near getting ar arrested in the diary room over a coat made out of a gorilla. Yeah, but it was all part of Pete's refusing to conform. Some people in the Celebrity Big Brother house that were very right on, uh, very uh, keen to demonstrate their very cosmopolitan, uh, liberal credentials. Well, I didn't kill it, it was a gift. Why you it? Done? Yes, I know, but if you wear it, you still show disregard. Do you, wear, do you wear leather shoes? I do. Do you use detergent? They are a byproduct of cows. Cows aren't endangered. Big apes are endangered. So am I. Pete just found that funny and found it pompous and wanted to prick it. And I think that he succeeded in that. Pete seemed wise to the reality of reality TV. Andy Warhol had a great saying that everybody will be famous for 15 minutes, but it now has become everyone will be famous in 15 minutes. And whilst in the house, it certainly seemed Pete didn't care about the fame or who he offended. What intrigued me more was the arguments with Jodie Marsh. With them two especially, it was totally unmissable. Everyone was talking about it. She's really getting right off the crap of my arse. You're insincere to the point of nausea. If he was coming across as being nasty and bitchy, then that's not really what I saw, or I saw the reason behind it, so it made sense. Hey. Don't pick on me again. Yeah, oh, you oh, just I, did I, it. And my best friend died, and my dad's ill, and my hair extensions oh, fell out. No, you my God. You can piss out of that if you want. That it just really makes you is. vile. Uh, oh, sorry. And you Jordan's got a nose like a, a mashed-in witch. 
I think the reason they clashed was because Pete was a very, very opinionated person and not afraid to, to share his opinions. I, I was amazed at his willingness to attack her because I, I've never seen that in Pete. And I, it, I found it surprising because the Pete I know had an incredible adoration of women. There were a lot of people who felt he was too cruel to Jody Marsh at the time, that he was, a, you know, abrasive and bullying. You're so desperate you for money to fluff your not. boobs out. That's what, why did you come in? I came in here to show the real me. Oh, well, fabulous. You've done a great job of it and you can't face the real you. You've done a yeah, great job of fully. it. And I hope fully. you fucking win. I hope you fucking win and you have that cross to bear. I don't think he was being mean. He was just being honest. And why shouldn't you? We're all, we're, everything these days is so carefully. Nobody can say anything that's going to offend somebody else. Pete didn't care. Brilliant. You can't live your life governed by other people's thoughts. If they were paying my mortgage, maybe I'd give it a second thought. But they're not. But through all the cattiness, there was one unlikely friendship that formed. I had never met anyone uh, quite like him before, or for that matter, since. And anyone who's met Pete Burns has never met anyone like him anyway. Watching the budding friendship, the bromance between George Galloway and Pete Burns was must-see TV. I mean, these two men could not have less in common on the surface. He said, funnily enough, that I was like a father uh, figure to him. And when he died, it was a surprise to me to learn that he was only five years younger than me. All the time I spent around him, frankly, I spent most of it laughing. Pete was so popular that he made it to the final, ending up finishing fifth. But that wasn't his original intention. His mindset was definitely, I'm going to be as evil as I can be so that I get out as quickly as possible but still get the full fee. And obviously that backfired because the worse he got, the more people loved him for his brutal honesty and, you know, never-ending kind of witticisms. Despite not winning, Pete was all anyone could talk about. When anyone mentions Big Brother to me, they say, oh yeah, the Pete Burns year, like that. So it was his, it, that was like his year. He was the one that everyone was talking about, and rightly so. I mean, I've seen a lot of Big Brother contestants in my, in my time, but Pete is just one of a kind. Like, he's unique. There's nothing quite like him. But being the latest tabloid sensation came at a price. I didn't understand it was going to cause such an invasion on my private life. The, well, let's say at first of all it was notoriety and then it quickly spread to fame. He once said to me that there's no one can prepare you for fame and it's like a bucket of hot piss being thrown in your face when it happens. The tragedy, I think, for Pete was, and it wasn't a tragedy for him, don't get me wrong, because, you know, reality television found him. Pete and anyone that goes in that house puts themselves in one of the most vulnerable public positions on any platform. Have you learned anything from your time in the house? That I really wouldn't do it again unless they offered me 25 times more money. On top of being hounded by the press, Pete was going through personal turmoil with both bankruptcy and divorce on the cards. In the midst of a meltdown, he was arrested and charged with assault after a domestic argument. Things just spiralled very publicly out of control and he ended up, you know, in prison. I think Pete's meltdown was to do with the pressure of the plastic surgery, um, the way he was treated that he had to go through the legal avenues he went through, that that's enough to demoralise anyone. The charges were eventually dropped, but just two months later, Pete was in the court again. After deciding to take action against the surgeon who performed his botched lip job. It involved a lot of time, a lot of um, medical... Uh, very intense medical terminology and money. I think it just scarred him a little bit. Back on baby. To pay his mounting legal fees, Pete made the occasional TV appearance where he appeared awkward and out of character. You don't need my hand. Uh, oh, put in. But in the end, Pete retreated more and more from the public eye. 
I'm more interested in people, human beings. I'm more interested in sitting in a cafe and watching people go by. Just simple things. I'm more interested in taking a five mile walk at five in the morning and coming home at two in the afternoon. They're the kind of things that I do. Contrary to what the public or his old friends were thinking. In my head, he was partying every night, going out every night, doing this, doing that. In reality, I don't think he was. Uh, in reality, I think he was like staying at home, watching TV and sleeping on the couch. Pete's world was shrinking and he became more withdrawn. I ran into him once, twice, uh, in the area that both he and I lived in for a while, um, but they were fleeting uh, encounters. I would occasionally bump into Pete at events, but he really didn't frequent as many things as people perhaps think that they do when they see him in the media. He just wanted a fairly quiet life, really. His closest friends were worried and offered to help. A few years ago, I actually offered to uh, have him come and live with me in Ireland for a while, just to get just to have a break. And he was seriously considering doing it, but it, it didn't happen. I made the offer because I was a bit concerned at the time that he wasn't too happy with the way things were. He did have problems, and I knew about them. Um, and just just hanging out and chilling and talking could have helped, you know. Pete needed some time away from the public eye. And how do you take time out when your body is the biggest billboard you have, advertising to the world who you are? Next, the death of an icon. I can't quite get my, my head around that Pete ha died. And how he'll be remembered. I mean, he had the, the most wicked tongue in the world. I mean, he could kill you from 30 yards off. I'm just so honoured to, to be able to say that I worked with him and knew him and met him. He was a butterfly in the hurricane. Pete Burns was an 80s pop icon and reality king extraordinaire. His music with Dead or Alive became the sound of a generation, and his sharp tongue in the Big Brother house helped to confirm his status as a unique national treasure. Well, she's a lovely, lovely woman. I adore her, but I just told her to fuck off. Earlier this year, Pete spent six weeks filming with a TV crew and gave what would be his last interview. During it, Pete talked about a previous dice with death, resulting from years of surgical procedures. As a result of all of the anaesthesia and antibiotics that I was exposed to, which do have side effects, I developed blood clots and pulmonary embolisms in my legs, heart, lungs. And one nearly ended his life. My driver came in, I was unconscious and not breathing, so they rushed me to a Devonshire Place hospital and they said he's gone. So I had less than 2% two chan two chance of survival, so they revived me. And Pete remembered vividly how it felt when he was close to death. It was a lovely feeling dying. I can remember being in the hospital and all wired up to tubes and thinking, if only they take these tubes out, it feels so nice. It felt so, it felt like being in a bath of velvet. It was such a nice feeling. Everything felt so soft and floppy and I wanted to go. And I can remember, remember they got the priest in to do the last rites as well. And I thought, what's that old creep doing? He's going to fiddle with me. With the near-death experience behind him, Pete was now looking forward to growing old disgracefully. I'm not very comfortable with the idea, technically, of ageing. Um, I'll never look forever young, but I'll look as best that I possibly can, and I'll look surreal. I'm going to take the step in the next 10 years into surreality, because I'll no longer look earthly. I don't want to look like a 65-year-old geezer. You know, and I can't really see it happening. He'd never have the chance to make that final transformation. Pete died on the 23rd of October 2016 of a massive heart attack caused by another pulmonary embolism, a blockage of an artery in his lungs. Pete was never going to be an old age pensioner. Uh, Pete Burns is an old age pensioner I could not see. Right to the end, Pete Burns delighted in refusing to conform. If people don't think I conform to their idea of what the norm is, that's their problem. 
are not mine. I'm not the norm. I'm not deluded. I'm not the boy next door. I'm the boy next door but one. I'm never going to fit in in that way. As I say, I live in a very confined, large and well-populated bubble. And I'm happy and I am the norm in that bubble. It's a very surreal situation. I can't quite get my, my head around that Pete died a few weeks ago. That wasn't in the plan. It's early days, it's, it's two weeks, it's, it's bullshit. This is a friend. This is almost, almost like a, a, a son. I mean, he had the, the most wicked tongue in the world. I mean, he could kill you from 30 yards off. You know, he really did. But he had the heart the size of Liverpool. I mean, he was the most generous and kind bloke I ever met. He, he's a real gentleman, and I don't use that word lightly. He really was, he was so sweet. I was devastated when I heard that Pete Burns had passed away. You don't ever think that your icons are going to die feel privileged to have known him and I just you know my heart goes out to his friends and family and fans you know because um, he's going to be missed. I was shocked that he was young I think 57 is very young um, I think he still had a lot to offer the world and a lot to do. I remember I, I found out on Twitter actually and I was so in shock I just couldn't believe it and I thought no that's not real I was at home and I went online and up it came. It was breaking news. I just say, actually, bless you, you're at peace now. Pete was due to release his entire back catalogue on the 28th of October 2016. It's now become a posthumous celebration of three decades of music. We changed hundreds of thousands of people's lives. To every artist, if they had one millionth of the personality of Pete Burns, they'd be superstars. He was well-versed and well-read. He was highly intelligent. He didn't do it to have hits. He did it because that's what he wanted to do. I will remember Pete Burns as a man who, through 22 long days and nights, really made me laugh. I mean, holding your sides your stomach sore laughs. I'm just so honoured to, to be able to say that I worked with him and knew him and met him. And a slightly awestruck presenter even got to join in with this raucous late night performance of Pete's all time classic. He was totally unique, totally unique and totally individual and totally inspirational. I think you've got a really, really lovely guy who you can just stand and have a chat with and, and have a joke. Everyone wanted to be Pete's friend because he was so funny and such a nice, generous fellow. You need someone like Pete Burns on your side. <laughs> You're like a Russian mobster, much better have him on your side than on the other side. And someone that walked to his own beat, actually, and that has to be commended. Someone who was spectacular, and it was, came rushing at you, like Cleopatra. I, I think Pete was one of my very favorite types of human being. He was a butterfly in the hurricane, and I just, love people who live their life like that. Oh, I would have loved more conversations with Pete. I mean, I never held back. I, I always told him I thought he was beautiful and great and exceptional and just so interesting he made me want to turn the telly on. I'm hoping he's somewhere, I don't know, on some kind of journey now, just loving every minute. You know, his legacy will go on. Like a record, baby. If you didn't get that, you shove it up your ass. <laughs>